to see a lot of people and some smiling faces. A few people told me they're very excited, so I'm going to use that excited energy. And some people I recognise in the crowd too, which is also good. I thought I'd just um, let you know why I'm speaking today. Um, so I'm, as um, Ella mentioned, author, international speaker and consultant, not just about vegan stuff, but I also give a lot of workshops and consultations on various things, including online etiquette and communication. There are my websites down here, if you want to check them out. And um, my vegan journey began in 1994 when I was at school, which is quite a long time ago. I just had my 20 year school anniversary even. And um, I went vegetarian first when one night on a Saturday night, um, my family and I, we would always used to have a leg of lamb. And I knew it was a lamb's leg because that's what it's called. But I didn't know what specific part of the lamb I was eating and that my sister and I both used to like. And I asked my mum one night, what is that? What am I eating? And she said, that's the Achilles tendon. And I looked down at my leg and I've got one of those too. And that was the first time that I made that connection between the life that existed and the death that I was about to consume. And that's when I stopped eating red meat. And um, in year 10, this was in year 10 at school, a few months after we went on a camp, and it was like city kids going into the country and looking after animals and stuff for a month. And I looked after chickens. And after that, I couldn't eat any chickens either. And um, so I was vegetarian originally because I didn't want to hurt anyone. I didn't want anyone to die just so I could consume them. And when I found out about the dairy and the egg industries, I went vegan. And in case you're not aware, the dairy and the egg industries are really horrible. And it's a fate worse than death sometimes for these animals who are used and abused continuously. So when I found out about that, I went vegan. <coughs> and that was 20 years ago in January. And hey, I'm still alive. <laughs> And I started a website over 10 years ago called vivalavegan.net and that started just after I finished my naturopathy, nutrition, western herbal medicine um, education and I always wanted to write a book and I thought, hey, I'm going to release calendars first, that should be a bit easy, it's only 12 recipes. So I released a couple of recipe calendars, three actually, and when I did that, I had another website, my leashontel.com website, that was mostly about my music. And I thought, I need a different platform to just talk about the vegan stuff. So I launched my um, website, and we relaunched it last year. So this is how it looks now. And it's over 10 years of information. And a few of my friends like to call me the most prolific blogger, vegan blogger in Australia. So I'm going to put that on my website one day. And um, so there's a hell of a lot of information on that. There's blogs, there's articles, there's interviews, there's how-to videos, and just so much information. So check it out if you haven't seen it. And yeah, I've been giving talks about the vegan lifestyle for over 10 years. <clears throat> I've released a couple of books up to my fourth one now, and it's on vegan athletes. So I interviewed over 100 vegan athletes from all over the world, from all different disciplines. And it's 430 pages. And Robert Cheek, I'm not sure if you know of him, one of my good friends from the US, he wrote the foreword. And you can see all the information at veganathletesbook.com or my website. And these are the other books I've released and some other books I've been in, and I've got heaps of other ebooks. Now, um, today my talk is called Ethics Beyond the Plate. Now, how many people here are vegan? That's quite a lot. Good. Impressed. What about vegetarians? Who doesn't care? Um, not many, okay. So, um, we've got a good crowd. So, what ethics beyond the plate to me means, and what I'm going to talk about today, is stuff that doesn't relate to food. 
doesn't relate to what you eat or what you don't eat because the last, say, five years, a lot's changed in regards to veganism. And if you have a look online, a lot of the internet searches relate to food, they relate to diet, they relate to fitness when you talk about being vegan. And there's a lot of terms that focus on these things, like raw vegan, high carb, low fat, all that sort of stuff. And I also want to talk about how the mainstream media focuses on middle class, mostly white and thin females in particular. And there's a hell of a lot more people who are outside of that narrow framework and that we need to really be thinking about and to keep in mind when we're promoting veganism. Now, 20 years ago, there was, you know, not much. We didn't have all these vegan restaurants, all these vegan products, all these vegan options. You know, I was just saying to someone before, 20 years ago, people literally thought I was going to die when I was vegan. So nowadays, everyone's still worried about my protein, but, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. And, you know, 20 years ago, you literally had to give up things and you had that sort of scarcity mentality. Still nowadays, I've got it. Like, if I go somewhere and I see vegan cake, I have to have that vegan cake. I just don't know when I'm going to get cake the next time. It's probably going to be the next day. But you still have that idea in your head that you have this scarcity mentality because 20 years ago, we really didn't have anything. The best thing that I had um, when you go to the grocery store or the supermarket, there was soy milk and there was one brand of vegan ice cream that was a vanilla and a chocolate. I can't remember the name of it anymore. And you were very, very excited if you went to a health food store and you got dark or carob chocolate. That was exciting. So you can imagine how, how harder it was then and how much easier it is now. Also 20 years ago, if someone came up to me, wherever I was in the world, and they said, hey, I'm a vegan, I knew exactly what that meant. That meant they cared about animals. That meant they weren't doing anything, including with their diet, to hurt any animals. And now, it's a bit more confusing. So now, so many products, businesses, restaurants, and it's really, really easy for people to go vegan. And I really like to point out that it's really easy for people to stay vegan, because that's also important. Now, the past four to five years, I've noticed, and mostly I blame this on Instagram, to be honest, um, a lot of people are using the term vegan. Now, because it's mostly on what people eat or what they don't eat, and a lot of it's about weight loss or control or fitness, and also it's using veganism under the same sort of umbrella term as allergens. So, I don't know how many of you, but um, one of my friends, every time she goes somewhere and they don't have vegan options, and they say something like, oh, but we've got gluten-free something or other, she has I don't want gluten-free, I want vegan. There's quite a difference. And so we're getting lumped in into this allergen-free sort of movement too. And there's a heap of food terms that are being talked about. So it's not just vegan. It's high-carb, low-fat vegan. It's low, no oil vegan. It's sugar-free vegan. It's gluten-free vegan. There's all these other food terms. But today, I want to talk about some ideas beyond just food. Now, I'm going to use some words that you may or may not have heard before, and if you don't understand what they mean, I'd really like for you to go out and do your own research about it. Just because I'm saying it doesn't mean that it's right, doesn't mean that it's true, I want you to do your own research, please. So some of the words I'm going to use, <coughs> ethics, intersectionality, oppression, privilege, compassion, and one of my favourites, effective communication. So if we're focusing on food aspects and food-related aspects, that's only one part of being vegan. And I think when people are promoting these things online, that sometimes they should be using the term plant-based instead. Because plant-based just means you're eating plants. It doesn't carry all the other ethical considerations that a vegan lifestyle does. 
and I fully, fully understand that words and meanings change over time. So many new words are added to the dictionaries at all time. But, you know, I find it really hard sometimes when I have more in common with someone who's a meat eater, who is interested in social justice issues, than I have with someone who's a vegan who really just wants to look hot in a bikini. So, in case you're not aware, let's start at the beginning. This is what a vegan is. It's someone who chooses not to consume any of these things. So it's animal flesh, animal secretions, animal products. And I'd like to point out honey is an animal product. Therefore, not eating honey is vegan. Also, animal byproducts. And but as I've said before, honey um, as I've said before, veganism is not just a diet. So this is the um, term that has been coined by someone from the Vegan Society in the UK. And the definition states that veganism is a way of living that seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing and any other purpose. So, the non-dietary areas are some of these. So, vegans choose to not use animals for any of these things. So, for clothing, for cosmetics and household goods, for testing products, and for entertainment. So, if you're a vegan, not only is it about what food you eat, but it's how animals are used in other ways that go beyond that that you either care about and you want to do something about. So veganism is a set of ethical guidelines that a hell of a lot of people now are starting to commit to, including myself. And there's many, many reasons to go and to stay vegan. And here's a few of them here. Animal rights and ethics, health, fitness, diet, environment and land right issues, human and labour rights, feminism and social justice issues. So why I'm vegan is because it encompasses all the things I believe in. So to me, these are really important. So consciousness raising, non-oppression, non-objectification and anti-consumerism. And I went vegan primarily for animal rights. I've also been involved in feminist environmental movements. And now I'm interested in social justice issues and how these interact with veganism. And it's my way of leading by example and showing people how to promote peace, love and compassion. And I've been talking about this for 10 years, so I obviously enjoy it somewhat. So, I think veganism is a great way of putting compassion into action, living in line with your beliefs, leading by example, and showing others how you want our world to be. And there's so many reasons. There's ones I've listed before, but there's so many others as well. And I want you to really think about learning something new and thinking about some other reasons that you can add to why you're already vegan. And, you know, I really want you to think about those sort of things because it's not important, it's important to be vegan, but it's more important to stay vegan. And so, just to go over it, vegans do not partake in any of these things. So, use, abuse, exploitation of non-human human animals for any reason, not just food, any reason. So more focus needs to be on things beyond what we do or we don't eat. So that's the whole idea of my presentation for today. Who likes puffins? They're so cute. Anyway, so veganism to me, it's just one step. It's really important, it's a very necessary step, but it's just one. <coughs> so I want you to get involved and to learn more and you know i think everyone should do this just in general in their life learn about different people learn about different cultures 
Learn from other people who've been there and been doing these things for years. There's so many great not-for-profits, there's so many great groups that have been doing some great things. And you know, you can use their content and information to share. And this can include things like undercover investigations, fact sheets, recipes, and videos. There's so many things. You don't need to create your own stuff. It might already be out there. I don't necessarily 100% agree with any groups, but a lot of people create awesome content that you can share. And so today, I'm hoping that you'll learn something new today, and I'm hoping that you'll share what you've learned with someone else. And I'd like you to think about how you can learn more, how you can do better, and become a better example of compassion in action. Does anyone know what the term intersectionality means? Has anyone heard of it before? So just a very small percentage. So let's go and we'll learn something new. So what it means in just a really basic way is it's linking other social justice issues to each other. And it's working together to make some changes. So I've just listed a few at the bottom here as some examples that intersectionality addresses. They include racism, sexism, speciesism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and ageism. If you're not sure what some of those words mean, please do a bit of your own research into that. Now, what I'm gonna do is go through a few different things. I'm gonna give you a couple of facts, and then I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'd like you to think about that, whether you think about it now and you know, yell out some answers, or whether you think about it later on while you're trying to sleep. So the vegan diet can be healthy. And now I have to put that in um, bold sort of letters because 20 years ago, you know, you could easily lose weight from a vegan diet and it was really great because you just literally focused on whole grains, fruits and veggies, nuts and seeds, beads, legumes and pulses. That's the four staples of a vegan diet. Nowadays, I bet you've had a lot more than just those sort of things if you've been eating vegan or been eating a plant-based diet. And there's a lot of not so healthy vegan foods. There's a lot of packaged and processed foods that exist now. And also, I've noticed in particular for young girls, there's a lot of restrictive and controlling eating that's used under the guise of healthy eating. And there's so many different types of vegan diets and plant-based diets. Here's just a few that I've listed. High carb, low fat, oil free, gluten free, vegan, which means a vegan who eats honey, not vegan. Um, and there's also, I've just heard a new one recently called um, vegan, has anyone heard of that? It's a vegan who eats eggs, that's also not vegan. So, um, you know, there's all these terms that people like to, you know, put, put one foot in, be vegan, but I'm not really. So, um, everyone's a bit confused, like I said, because of all these um, words that people keep spreading around. So, here's some questions I'm going to ask you in regards to health. So, if we think about all the not so healthy vegan products that exist, should veganism still be promoted as a healthy diet? Should veganism be promoted as a cure all? And what can we do to encourage others to be flexible with their diets and not just be, oh, I'm only going to eat food that doesn't have oil in it, or I'm just going to be, you know, low carb or things like that? Because these things long term are not very easy to commit to. What more can we do to encourage people to commit to the lifestyle long term? And how can we show the different types of vegans that exist? Now, here's some environmental impacts of animal products. And as vegans, we're not, con we're not contributing to any of these things, obviously. But they're quite, quite massive. In case you're not aware, here's a few things I've listed. Animal products are inefficient as a food source. Instead of eating, say, soy products ourselves, we're feeding the soy to cows and we're eating the cows. It's a bit weird. Um, and the scale of the industry is massive. There's like hundreds of billions of animals killed annually. And I don't know if anyone in here has been to America or American, 
happened. I remember the first time I was driving along and seeing all the animal areas, and it was just miles and miles of factory farms. It was horrific. Land degradation, land clearing, greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gas emissions range from 20 to 50%. But many say that this is actually underrepresented. Now, um, one of the guys, Paul Marnie, he's from Victoria. He writes some really good information about the environmental impacts of a non-vegan diet. And he's written a few articles on my vegalavegan.net website too. So check out his stuff. So thinking about those things that we as vegans do not um, help um, the degradation and that from the environment. Here's some other things I want you to think about. So where does your food come from? What are the growing, producing and packaging processes involved with your vegan food? How far has your favourite packaged vegan food travelled? Have you thought about food miles and things like that? What about food scarcity, food security? Quinoa is an example. Um, there's a lot of people who have issues with how quinoa has been used in certain areas and now it's not affordable to the local people. And um, do you support in-season, non-GMO, organic and locally grown produce? And people, we forget, everyone's like, I love animals, I love animals. But then they're mean to each other, and mean to each other online in particular. And I'd like you to think about people like unskilled and undocumented workers. I don't know anyone who goes when they're young, I'm going to be an abattoir worker. I don't know, do you know anyone? I've never met them. So there's a reason that people do these sort of jobs and it's not because they choose to do them. So I just want you to think about these things. And I want you to think about some of these questions as well. And about your vegan clothing, your shoes, your favourite brands. What are the ethics and the conditions involved in the manufacturing processes? Do you know how these things are produced? And do people who make these items get paid a fair wage? And what about some other terms? Feminism, human rights, reproductive issues. So people and feminism... In case you're not aware, feminists are against the objectification and commodification of their bodies. How do you think that relates to animals? So feminists are against their bodies being seen as product. And do you think that defending one type of body, female body, while using and abusing another is okay? And do you think different types of bodies and people should be used to promote veganism? Now, domestic violence in particular in Australia, there's a massive um, push for um, people being aware of it at the moment. It's a massive issue. And there's a lot of information and research that's gone into showing people that if people are harming animals at a young age, they, this can sometimes lead to harming of people if, it's, if it remains unchecked. So should we dismiss certain types of behaviour um, just because of someone's age, their sex, their position in society or their class? Think about some things like, oh, he's young, he'll get over it. Oh, that's just what boys do. Is that right? What do you think? And I don't know if you're aware of the term privilege or if you understand how that links to things, but I just want you to think about a few of these things today. So most of us, probably most of us in here, we have privileges that we're not really able to understand or appreciate, and unless they're taken away from us. So this can, this can include many things. Like some people can't afford to attend vegan events because they can't pay for them. They can't afford to, um, you know, promote or support vegan restaurants because they can't afford those sort of things. And it's important to be mindful of others and it's important to exercise compassion. And like, everyone's judgmental, it's so easy to be judgmental, but I really want you to try not to be. Not hard, shouldn't we? And um, yeah, we all think that we know the right answers, we all think that we have all the right answers, 
but we can always learn something more from someone else. And this is a quote that I like to give a lot because people forget about it all the time. We all have choices, but some people have much better choices than others, okay? Now, I want you to think about what people are able to do, and here's some things I'd like you to think about. So, are people able to access spaces and events? Are people able to access transportation to events? Are people able to afford meetups, restaurants and events? Are people able to be comfortable in a space and around someone or another type of person? And, you know, some people just can't get through their day sometimes. Some people need some sort of drugs or some sort of help to be able to even get out of the house. And can everyone understand what is being communicated? Hope you can all understand me at the moment. And in regards to privilege, I really want you to think about some of these things here. Some people can't choose to not eat particular foods. I remember a few years ago, I was giving talks throughout Indonesia and I was um, showing people how to make vegan cheese sauce in particular, and the main ingredient was nutritional yeast. Now, how many people in Indonesia do you think would have nutritional yeast? Not many. It's quite a high-priced item that not many people can afford. So I had to think about those sort of things. What other things could I talk about other than that? Some people can't afford to buy new vegan clothes or vegan shoes. Some people can't access transport to support vegan restaurants or vegan events. And some people um, aren't mentally or physically able to attend protests or demos. Some people don't feel comfortable amongst another sex. Some people don't feel as though they belong in certain spaces because no one really looks like them. And some people don't feel their opinion is valid enough to share it. So I really want you to think about making spaces and making vegan spaces in particular more inclusive. I want to talk about how people use black vegans as props. And this is a big thing because we use certain types of people um, when we want to, when we think they're going to promote our cause but maybe we don't think about how they might feel about it. So I want you to think about how you use people when you're discussing or marketing veganism. And we're not trying to use them as props. We don't need to commodify a group of people to further our agenda or what we're trying to do. You can still promote something and still be mindful and compassionate to someone else. There's some really cool books. Um, well, they're actually pretty intense books. But um, these two here, Dreaded Comparison and Internal Treblinka, that are good examples of the connection between slavery and human supremacy that use really good um, language in a respectful way. So if you'd like to know how to maybe talk about these issues, I'd suggest you have a look at those books. And um, there's a great, there's quite a few good um, websites that I'll get to in, in one of the next slides. But this is from Justin Van Cleek from Striving with Systems. And um, these are some tips. So we want to stop being too liberal with how we apply language and learn to be sensitive towards others when we're having these sort of discussions. We want to amplify the voices of marginalised people. And we want to um, do this in a respectful way. <coughs> And think about um, what it's saying about your activism if you need to say these things when you haven't experienced them yourself. And you need to make an attempt to understand how this oppression impacts different groups and so it maximises your impact and builds a more broader and more inclusive community and society. And here's an example of why, you know, promoting white vegans or promoting a certain type of vegan all the time is racist and maybe using certain images of, of black people or black vegans why it's racist. So this is a quote from Claire and um, the article was veganism has a serious race problem. 
And I'll read it. Material designed to provoke a white audience is also liable to alienate a black audience. We don't want be, we don't do not want to be alienating others. By using slavery as a tool to promote vegan values, vegan activists make clear that vegan spaces are frequently racist spaces. If you're promoting something and it's racist and people are seeing it as racist, why are they going to come to an event where they feel as though they're going to be excluded from it? And it's often the case in predominantly white spaces where racism goes unchecked that there is little room for people of colour. And this marginalisation results in the perception that veganism is a movement by and for white people, which it really is. And there's a lot of people, people of colour, who are vegan, but you don't really see that getting marketed in the mainstream. Um, this is another thing from Afropunk, Stephanie Brown. This is really good. And um, it's quite a long one, so I won't read it. But it's just the main point that I've highlighted here is what does it mean when white vegans argue against the demand to be viewed and represented as fully human rather as props in their version of non-human liberation? So just think about the words you're using and think about the phrases and the images you're using and whether or not it's just a prop and whether or not you're thinking about how someone else might feel if they see that. It might trigger people. So here's some good websites to check out. Um, Black Vegans Rock, mostly um, US based. Most of these are US based actually. Um, Food Empowerment Project, that's probably my favorite group actually, to be honest. And um, they do a lot of really cool stuff about environment and humans and animals, not just vegan as food. The Intersectional Vegan on Tumblr, Sister Vegan Project and Vegan Feminist Network. There are all some really good websites to hope you check out. And I want you to always think about learning something new and know that you know what we know now isn't all that there is. And there's so many other movements that we can learn from. If you've shared something online and someone says, hey, you know, it's a bit disrespectful, or if you thought about rewording that in a particular way, it might be annoying, you might get put off by it, but take the chance to go, hey, this person might know about something that I don't know about, and you need to be um, open to learning more from them. One a great example of welcoming allies is the LGBTQI community. And they have accepted a lot of people into the movement who aren't necessarily gay, who aren't necessarily lesbians, but there's a lot of people who are allies to this movement. Now, how can we learn from these sort of movements? And how can we get people involved? And how can we get people involved in other social justice movements and support their causes? How can we encourage others to support our movement, whether or not they're vegan? So, like, allies, not 100% into, into being vegan or into the movement, but how can we get more allies? And, you know, this is really important. How can we promote veganism in the most inclusive way? Not just all about white Western people. So, um, the best way to promote something is to find out what people are passionate about. What's important to you? What makes you tick? What's, make, what's going to make you actually do something? And um, if you can find out people's passions and motivations, um, you can plant the seeds of change. And vegans are still 1% to 2% of the population. So we probably do need a few more allies, I think. And um, I, like I was saying before, it's not just being vegan, it's staying vegan. And there's lots of reasons why people stay vegan. And these are just some, this is some information that's from the Humane Leads Lab. And um, I'd suggest you follow them if you're into stats and data and stuff like that instead of, instead of someone just making up a false claim and making a nice meme and then everyone thinks it's true. Um, so these are some facts from their research, the reasons why people stay vegan. So animal welfare is the most effective way to get people to eat less meat. And health reasons are the second best. Now for me, I don't understand those sort of things. I'm like, I care about the animals. Once I found out about how they were being hurt, 
I want everyone to know the reasons I went vegan. And if I told them, they should just go vegan because I did as well. Why, why is that so hard? Because not everyone cares about the same things that you do. You have to find out what other people care about as well. And whether or not I agree with animal welfare instead of animal rights, or I agree with people eating less meat instead of being vegan, this is the main reason why people will stay vegan, which is what we want, or even start to go vegan. Um, some other good books that I seriously um, want you to read, Nick Cooney from the States, he's written three books. His latest one is How to Be Great at Doing Good, and he started the Humane League in Australia that now has become the Humane, or one of the branches of the Humane League Labs. And they talk about how to be effective, because it's all well and good to be an activist or to be spreading the word about particular things, but if you're not effective with the way that you're delivering the message or if you're not effective with how you're delivering it, is it going to work? Is it going to be worth your time? Now, um, as a vegan, or as a lot of vegans, we really don't just care about um, non-human animals, so we all need to start acting like it, because a lot of people don't. We need to learn more about each other and the world around us. And we need to know that all systems of oppression need to be challenged and need to be stopped. That's why I'm linking all these different things together, because every single one of them I've mentioned is a form of oppression. And I understand there's only 24 hours in a day. This is very overwhelming, giving you so much more information. There's only a few things that you can handle at one time. Um, but I want you to start with what resonates the most with you. When I was talking about stuff, what were things you were, oh yeah, that's it. I'd like you to start with that, find out more information about that. And you know, what are you most passionate about and what are you best at communicating? That's a great place to start. And I want you to always aim to listen and learn more and focus on more good and less harm. Now, online, I give talks about online communication, online etiquette all the time, and I really don't understand why people are mean to each other. I don't think it's hard. You have to say something, just maybe think about it first, sleep on it, think about a different way you could maybe say certain things. And yet, you can still disagree with someone without using horrible names, horrible terms, and negative words. And remember, rightly or wrongly, you may be the only vegan that someone comes in contact with. And what you do and how you do it reflects the whole movement. So we need to start acting like that. Here's my top 10 tips for online etiquette. So the top tip, and the most important, is act, don't react. I think just that for life in general is a really good tip. Um, if you have a private matter, not every single person online needs to know about it. Just you maybe send someone a direct message or an email and just talk to them about it. Use correct spelling, grammar and punctuation. Be mindful and conscious of what you're sharing, who's actually going to be reading it. Be kind and keep your passwords safe and make them hard to guess. That's a whole other thing, security online, that's a good start. Um, if you see someone being mean to someone, being not very nice online, please report it. And if you use something that someone else has created, like that, that's one of my own lettering examples, credit someone who has used it. So many great images, so many great recipes, but no one seems to credit anyone anymore. And I want you to take responsibility for everything you do online. So here's some things in particular that I want you, if you, have, if you don't think about anything else from what I've said today, I hope you think about these sort of things. So these are some things I want you to be mindful of and think about and keep in your head next time you're interacting with someone. What language do you use when you're promoting veganism? Is it positive or negative? Is it encouraging or is it discouraging? Is it empathetic or is it judgmental? Is it preaching or is it teaching? Do you use racist language when you talk about other cultures and, their, and countries? For example, J Japan and dolphins or whales? 
China and dog meat, the Middle East and live export? Do you use trigger words that might truly upset someone? This includes things like slave rape concentration camps. Do you give unsolicited health advice or tell terminally ill or disabled people that they will be cured if they go vegan? Now, every single one of those I've seen many times online and in person. So please keep these things in mind the next time you're trying to promote veganism. Here's some advice. I want you to do your own research, I want you to investigate, and I want you to read more. The people nowadays, like years ago when I got my qualifications for naturopathy, not practicing anymore, but people respected someone that had some sort of background, had some sort of knowledge. Nowadays, because of online, the person who speaks the loudest or is the most aggressive seems to be the people who people actually listen to. So just because they're saying something, just because everyone's liking it or following them, doesn't mean it's necessarily true. So please do your own research. And focus on finding out what connects us to each other, other than the things that disconnect us, because there's a lot more that we have in common with people. <coughs> Um, so lead by example and be consistent. In my 20 years of vegan, that would be my best tip for everyone. Lead by example, be consistent. And I really want you to be the best version of yourself and I'd like you to start from now. And you know, it's all about small steps. It might seem overwhelming all the information I've given you today, but just find out some more about something different each time you can. And you know, once you give someone an idea or once you plant some sort of seed, they can ignore it for a while, but they've still under understood it. And I've got a heap of friends who 10, 20 years ago I mentioned something, and they'll quote it back to me. I've forgotten that I even said it, but they'll go, that's why I went vegan. That's why I went vegetarian. And you know, there's still, all these little small steps along the way still get to the same destination. They're still important. And remember, importantly, that what works for you may not work for other people. And it might not even be effective like we saw before with some of the other stats. And we're all made up of the same thing, but we're not all the same. Here's a couple of other things. Focus on encouragement instead of judgment. Focus on educating and planting seeds instead of preaching and trying to convert. A great example, when I was giving the talks throughout Indonesia a few years ago, one of the events in Denpasar was um, um, one of the guys said, oh, we're going to have about 2,000 people at the event, and we should get about half of that who will be vegan. And I'm like, oh, okay, really? Why do you think that's true? And so just because you're giving people information doesn't mean they're going to follow it, doesn't even mean they'll listen to it. So please remember, and I think that's one thing I've learned over the years as well, don't get attached to outcomes, you know, just if you think and focus on just planting seeds, it's always better. Always remember kindness, always remember compassion, and be the best vegan you can be, or vegan in training for your other people. And I want you to start now. And if you want to connect with me, here's um, my information online. So that's my vivalavegan.net website, and that's all the social media channels and Instagram recently. And there's my Le Chantel website and all the other social media channels for that as well. So you can find me online. So I hope you've learned something today. And if you have learned something, I really want you to tell someone else about it and to encourage other people to always be learning about something new. And I hope you've learned about some things that relate to not just food and many different words that I mentioned today. So thank you very much.